welcome, night wanderers, to Mr. Sleepy Hollow Explorations, where sleep awaits in the shadows. Are you ready to drift off into a world of calm? I'm Mr. Sleepy Hollow, your guide through these cozy and spooky nights, here to help quiet the mind and bring you a little extra peace. As someone who battles with sleep, I know how helpful these gentle escapes can be, so I'm thrilled to share this with you with a few hauntingly soothing twists. This video will softly fade into darkness in just five minutes, lulling you closer to rest. And if you'd like, follow along with the subtitles our spectral guide will lead you through. Before you close your eyes, let me know where are you tuning in from tonight? Share your corner of the world in the comments. And if this video adds a bit more calm to your night, please consider subscribe, leaving a like, or sharing your thoughts below. Wishing you a night full of sweet dreams, cookie serenity. By Reddit user Lecter Black. I love my wife above all else. I have loved her since the moment I first laid eyes on her. I would do anything for her and that has never changed after all these years. We first met in college. We were both theater majors and it was day one of acting one class that our eyes met for the first time. She had chocolate brown eyes that were complemented by her dark brown curls. We stared at each other constantly that first day, and when we were partnered together, we knew that it was fate. My name is Margaret, she said as soon as I walked up to her after class. I took her by an hand and kissed it. Henry, I responded. She then took one of my long dreadlocks and wrapped it around her finger, staring me in the eyes and biting her lip. It was an amazing meeting with an even better ending later that night. The following night, we went on our first date, a theater production of Sueno. We held each other's hand through the entire performance, and afterward, I walked her to her dormitory. Every day after that was like a love story. We went through good times and bad times. We broke up and got back together. Through it all, one thing never changed for me. I loved her and would do anything for her. We got married after graduation and went on to become very successful in the stage acting scene. We were considered a power couple and were always cast in romantic roles opposite each other. It was easy to bring the true deep love that we felt for each other to the stage, and it was nice to make money from it. One day, our lives took a turn. We had just finished a successful performance of the stage play The Clean House when we were approached by a member of the audience. That was an amazing performance, he said, a creepy English accent behind his words. Why thank you, you're sweet, said Margaret, gripping my hand. I could tell this guy had creeped her out, but being a talented actress, she was able to put on a nice front. I've been watching you two for a very long time, he continued his pale blue eyes staring into Margaret. I am very much a fan of your work. Every performance is riveting, and I can tell that you put true passion into your exchanges. You two must truly love each other. We do, I said, stepping slightly in front of Margaret. We love each other very much. I would do anything for her. I looked at her, and she gave me that beautiful smile of hers. That warms my heart to hear, he said as he put his arms behind his back and looked up into the night sky. True love is a valuable gift that is often taken for granted. If you're not careful, you can easily lose it forever, and it can never be replaced, no matter how hard you try. He then looked at me, and I could see just how disturbing his pale blue eyes were. Hold on to that gift. Cherish it forever. He began to walk away before I asked the question that had been bothering me since we met. Who are you? I yelled. He stopped and turned his head. Your biggest fan, he answered. He then walked away. Margaret and I looked at each other, baffled at what had just taken place. Later that night, we were sitting on our couch watching a movie when suddenly there was a knock at the door. Wonder who that could be said Margaret as she got up to see who it was, at the peephole and froze in place before taking a single step back and opening the door.
Standing just outside the door was the same man we had talked to earlier that night. He stood there with his arms behind him, his pale blue eyes shining like the moon. Honey, I said, standing up from the couch to join Margaret at the door. Please, come in, Margaret said to the man, to my shock. What are you doing? I yelled, running to get to the door. The man stepped inside before I got there and began to stroke her face. When I finally got to them, I threw my fist and connected with his face, knocking him back outside. I quickly slammed the door and locked it. I turned to Margaret, who was in some sort of a trance. I tried to snap her out of it. Margaret. I yelled, shaking her. Margaret. Wake up. There was nothing I could do to get her to respond. I shook her, slapped her, and even splashed water in her face. Nothing. Nothing would work. Suddenly, the lights in the house went out. I looked around until I said the silhouette of a man standing outside our living room window. I blinked, and it was gone. I began to panic and ran to the gun safe in our bedroom. Despite being theater nerds, we were very well trained in self-defense and firearms. We could each hold our own if our lives were in danger, and if there was ever a time to put that training to use, it was now. When I got back to the living room, I immediately raised my weapon. There stood the strange man, holding Margaret by the face. Let go of her, motherfucker. I yelled, aiming for his head. He looked at me, and the only thing I could see in the darkness was glowing red eyes. He then turned his head to Margaret and I fired, hitting him directly in the head. He fell to the floor hard and I ran over. Margaret fell over too but I caught her before she hit the ground. She still would not respond, her eyes wide open in a trance. I looked over to the man, but he was gone. I gently laid her on the floor and stood up quickly, readying my weapon once again. Suddenly, I felt a strong, tight grip on the back on my neck and I was then thrown across the room, hitting the wall. I groaned in pain as I grabbed my gun and slowly stood to my feet, shaking as I raised my weapon again. Again, he had a hold of Margaret, but this time he pulled her head close to his. I felt my heart race and my blood boil as he put her lips to his, his glowing red eyes staring right at me. No. I screamed as I ran towards them. He then pushed her to the side and opened his arms to me, as if inviting me to fire on him again. I obliged and fired five rounds into him, but all he did was allow them to connect as he laughed. I ran up to him but he grabbed me by the throat before I could do anything. He pulled me close to his face and I could see every horrifying feature. Not only did he have demon-like eyes, but his face was covered in disgusting, pulsating veins. In his mouth were two sharp fangs and a long slimy tongue, which rubbed against my face, as if tasting me before taking his first bite. I lifted my gun to the arm that had a hold of me and fired twice. He growled in pain as he released me and I connected the butt of my gun to his face, repeatedly. He fell to the floor and I mounted him, smashing his face more and more, harder and faster. I could feel the blood gush and spray all over as the bones in his skull crack and collapse. By the time I was done, there was nothing but smashed bone, brains, and blood. I panted as I stood back up and limped over to Margaret, who was now fully unconscious. I shook her and she finally opened her eyes, looking into mine with fear and confusion. Margaret, I said, feeling relieved that she was all right. I held her close and we lay there until I looked over to where the body of the stranger should have been. He was gone and panic arose once again and we both stood up quickly. I turned to face Margaret and screamed when I saw him standing behind her, still in the process of regenerating his face. Before I had a chance to react he sunk his fangs deep into Margaret's neck. She screamed in pain as I screamed in rage, hitting the monster in the skull once again with my gun. I felt bone crack again as he released her. Again, I mounted him and went to work, growing exhausted the longer it went. I knew this wouldn't last, as he would surely regenerate again. 
It soon became obvious what exactly I was dealing with. He had put Margaret into a trance, merely by looking at her, even looking through a peephole. It wasn't until he invited him inside that he actually got in. He had glowing red eyes and fans, and he bit Margaret in the neck. He's a goddamn vampire, I thought to myself. While he was down, I ran to the kitchen and grabbed an old wooden broom. I broke it in half and ran back to the body, where I rammed it as hard as I could directly into his heart. The body began to convulse and flail its arms and legs all over. Suddenly, it stopped and went completely limp, before melting away into deep red blood and other disgusting fluids. After catching my breath, I slowly turned my attention to Margaret. She sat there in the darkness, legs folded and upper torso full erect. Honey, I said, nervously approaching her. In the darkness, I could only see her silhouette, until her eyes began to slowly glow red. There was only one thing I could think of to do. I love my wife. I would do anything for her. Even if that meant chaining her up in the basement, feeding her a pint of my own blood every day while I figure out what to do about her. When the hunger would hit her, she became like a wild animal that cannot be communicated with. So, I fed her my blood and she became herself again. She understood the situation and never held it against me. It wasn't easy, but it was all we could do. Unfortunately, a pint only went so far, until soon it wasn't enough. So I gave more and more until the point that I was endangering myself with so much blood loss. It was then that I decided to feed her, full meals. It started with small animals at first, and then cats and dogs. Soon I made the hard decision to invite homeless people into our home, knock them out, and give them to her. This went on for far too long before it really started to affect us. She felt like a monster and I did as well. I love my wife and I would do anything for her, which brings me to now. I'm sitting here, writing this, shaking. There is literal blood on my hands as I try to compose myself. She asked me to do one last thing for her. I refused at first, because I loved her too much. If you love me, she began, looking me deep in my eyes, her now pale blues not blinking, you will do this. Tears fell from both of our eyes as I pulled her in close. I love you, Margaret, I whispered. I love you, Henry, she responded. I could hear the squish as I drove the wooden stake in her heart. I trembled as I listened to her whimpers, gasps, and eventual silence. I broke down as her body melted away into liquid. I lay there in her remains, sobbing. I sit here now, with nothing left but the warning about the creatures of fiction that are very much a reality. I write my confession of the crimes I have committed out of love. I say goodbye to any friends or loved ones that may be reading this. I loved her, and I did everything for her. I was claimed by a skinwalker, part one. By ready user Bloodhunter 62. I'm Jake, a 22 year old male currently attending Clemson University in Clemson, South Carolina. Seeing as it's my last year at the uni before I graduate, my friends and I planned a camping trip for the last week of school. The hardest part was fitting everyone in my jeep, but we managed. What the hell is that, Chase? I asked, already knowing the answer. A blunt, duh. Chase was the stoner of our group, because every group just has to have one. He was a chubby little white boy, about 5'8", with brown hair pulled up in a bun and just enough chin hair to look like Shaggy from Scooby-Doo. Damn it man, you're not gonna hotbox my car. I exclaimed. I would shake my head in disbelief if I wasn't so used to it. I agree with Jackie. At least save it for when we get there, Blair chimed in. Blair was the most playful one in our group, at least around me. She was about 5'6 with fair skin, long red hair, light freckles around the bridge of her nose, and bright green eyes. Thanks Blair, 
I said with a sigh of relief. She smiled at me and went back to playing whatever choose your own adventure game she had recently installed. We didn't even make it five minutes without another argument in my backseat. I let out another sigh, it's going to be a long week. When we arrived at the forest, I made sure to do a head count in case we lost anyone at a rest stop. Okay there's Blair and Chase, staying as far away from each other as possible. There's Aljo. Aljo was a really muscular guy with dark skin who stood around 6'2", had a dark high top hairstyle, and a well-maintained beard. And there's Cory. By far the nicest person in our group, Cory stood at 5'3", had caramel colored skin, and curly brown hair that framed her face nicely. So Jake, what are we waiting for? She asked in the nicest way possible, let's go enjoy the great outdoors. I half expected her to end up singing to the little woodland creatures on our way there. No point in delaying it any longer, I guess. While we were scouting out the forest for a good campsite, I felt strangely calm. There's just something about being in the woods that feels so serene. The birds singing their sweet songs as the sunlight reflects through the beads of dew on the leaves is just so relaxing. My moment of peace was interrupted, however. Something was off. It was just enough for you to notice, but not enough to pinpoint. I stopped walking and concentrated on finding the source of my unease. After a few moments, my ears caught it. One bird was out of sync. All the other birds were singing in perfect unison, but this little guy was half a beat behind. No one else seemed to notice it, so I just kept walking. I still thought it was a bit weird, but oh well. The little guy was probably still learning, after all. When we finally found a site we could all agree on, it was almost dark. Chase and Cory started building a campfire, while Blair, Aljo, and I began assembling the tents. So Jake, Aljo began, you brought the arrows, right? Of course, did you bring the bow? I responded. Instead of responding, he simply tossed the bow my way. I grabbed it and tested the drawstring. It felt nice and strong, tight but reflexive. It was a beautiful maple wood bow gifted to Aljo by the Navajo tribe we had met a few years back in Utah. I set it down near his tent and got to work helping Blair set up ours. Here, let me get that for you, I said as I hammered a tent spike down. Thanks Jackie, she said with a smile, I'll go get our bags. Before she could take a step toward the car, Chase showed up in front of her. I'll go with you then, he said with the creepiest wink I've ever seen. He has a really punchable face, I thought. How about you just go get them by yourself? Blair retorted with a wink of her own. Chase sighed in defeat and started off toward the car. While Chase was getting our bags from the car, the rest of us sat around the campfire. Cory was talking to Aljo with a bright smile on her face, as usual. I heard something about it being a nice night for S. Maurice before I was reminded of the redhead sitting next to me. So Jackie, you ready to spend a whole week with us? Blair asked playfully. She said us, but I knew she was more so asking if I was ready to spend a week with her. There's no one I'd rather be stuck with, I replied with a wink. Her eyes lit up at this and her smile grew wider, making me wonder what I had just gotten myself into. She grabbed my wrist and yanked me toward her tent. Ugh Blair, you sure this is the best time for this? I asked hesitantly. Oh shut up Jackie. She pulled me in the tent and zipped away my view of Aljo giving me a thumbs up and Cory just staring, innocently wondering what was happening. I turned around to find Blair, tablet in hand. She held it out to me and told me to choose a game. Well this isn't what I thought was gonna happen. I tapped on one called not much time and sat down on the tent floor. She sat next to me with her head on my shoulder and we alternated choices in the game. Apparently this one was about someone who suddenly has the power to stop time. My first choice was whether to use my power to help someone, steal from someone, hurt someone, or just restart time. I decided to help someone. Oh but that's so boring Jackie. 
Blair whined. She, of course, used her choice to hurt someone the next time we played. We ended up replaying the game five more times before we fell asleep. When I woke up, I could see rays of sunlight peeking in through small holes in the tent. My right arm was still asleep, so I went to move it, but couldn't. I looked over to find Blair hugging my arm like a teddy bear. I let out a sigh and gently freed my arm from her death grip. I noticed the dead tablet on the floor and plugged it into a portable charger. I unzipped the tent and walked out into the fresh pine-scented air. I thought I was the first one awake, but that thought was shattered when I noticed smoke coming from Chase's tent. Really? This early in the morning. I relit our campfire and boiled water for some oatmeal. I made sure I had enough for everyone and poured in the packets. In a few minutes, I had two bowls of oatmeal and headed back to Blair's tent. Hey Blair, I made breakfast. She was still asleep. Hey dummy, I got you something, I said as I nudged her with my foot. She whined about not wanting to go to school today and tried to go back to sleep. I sighed and put the bowl down in front of her face and, like a dog, she sniffed a little and opened her eyes. Oh hey, Jackie, she said as I rolled my eyes. I sat down next to her and ate my oatmeal. Well, I guess it could be worse. Throughout the day, we each did various chores around camp. Blair and Corey decorated everyone's tents, Chase got wood for the fire, and Aljo and I went hunting. Aljo was more familiar with the bow than I was, so I was wielding my knife. The knife, a six-inch bowie, made for an easy kill up close, while Aljo was our ranged predator. So far all we had seen were rabbit and deer tracks, but neither of the animals that had left them. We set up some snares for the rabbits and decided it would be best to set up an outpost in a tree to let the deer come to us. We found a decent sized tree and climbed up to wait in the branches. While we waited on our prey, Aljo was dead silent. I felt calm and focused, like I was a born predator on the hunt. This feeling was quickly shattered, leaving only unease in its wake. My eyes scoured the forest floor for something, anything out of place. That's when I saw it, there was a single deer grazing on the dew-covered blades of grass. As it gaped to another patch of grass, I studied it for abnormalities. The problem was easy to identify, as the deer walked differently from any deer I had ever seen. Its steps were janky, uncertain almost as if it thought the floor might give out from beneath it. It would tap the ground with its front hoof in one spot and then stomp the same hoof down a foot away from where it tapped. As it did this, it was making a noise. It sounded almost like a low growl. Now, maybe there was an explanation for its lurching steps, but I know deer don't growl. As I thought this, the deer's head suddenly jerked up toward me and Aljo. My breath caught in my throat and my heart lurched as violently as the deer had stepped. The deer, no, the demon was now gazing into my very soul with its bright yellow eyes. I couldn't bring myself to look away, that is, until Aljo fired an arrow into the damn thing. The thing let out the most blood-curdling screech I've ever heard before or since. It took off into the bushes and we got the hell out of that tree. That night, we were all chilling by the campfire eating S. Mori's. Corey and Aljo were talking again and really seemed to be hitting it off. I smiled at the thought of my two friends being happy together, they certainly deserved it. Chase had gone into the woods to take a leak and should be getting back any time now. I started thinking about that deer again. What was that thing? It couldn't have been a deer. I'll try to keep you all S.A. I was broken out of my thoughts by a small hand gripping mine. I looked to my right to find Blair smiling at me. What you thinking about Jackie? She asked in her usual, playful tone. Just how good these S. Mori's are, I said with excitement. Thanks for bringing the chocolate. She laughed and punched my arm. You're a bad liar. Yeah, no Jackie. She teased me. No really. These are great, babe, I replied in between bites. She laughed again and rested her head on my shoulder. We were all laughing about some embarrassing memories of Chase, 
when we heard an ear-piercing screech. My heart threatened to jump out of my chest and into the fire. It was the same screech that the deer had made earlier that day. Aljo and I shared a glance and jumped into action. I grabbed my blade and he his bow and quiver of arrows. We were just about to head out to find Chase when Blair grabbed my hand and looked me straight in the eyes. She didn't need to say anything for me to know she was scared. I looked over at Aljo and only received a nod in response. He headed out while I sat back down with Blair and Corey. He was capable of handling this on his own and I couldn't just leave Blair and Corey defenseless. I gripped my knife tighter and tighter as the minutes turned to hours waiting for Chase or Aljo to return. Blair tried to calm me down and assured me everything would be okay, but I knew neither of us really believed that. As the sun's light began to cut through the trees, Chase walked back into camp. I jumped up and rushed toward him. He looked toward me and my steps faltered. For a split second, I thought I saw yellow eyes staring at me from his backy, sunken in orbitals. I blinked and they were back to his normal stormy gray. I'm going crazy, aren't I? I thought to myself, where have you been? I asked in a more panicked tone than I had meant to use. Taking a leak, he said. I thought there was something wrong with his voice, but it was back to normal so quick that I just brushed it off as me going crazy again. Blair came over to my side and asked Chase some questions, but he seemed to be normal Chase. Corey, however, stayed by the now dying campfire. Where's Aljo? She asked, fear weighing heavily in her voice. I don't know, Chase responded, with that weird tone again. I made a mental note to remember that tone shift. Corey took a stumbling step backwards. I don't believe you, she screamed at him. This wasn't like her at all. What happened to that sweet little woman who was always smiling? I thought. Chase took a lurching step toward her and I instinctively moved in between the two, gripping my knife with white knuckles. I had seen that type of movement before. He looked me up and down and walked to his tent. Something's very wrong here. Blair and I spent the rest of the day trying to comfort Corey in any and every way we could think of. We made her some more esmores, gave her a shoulder massage, played games with her on Blair's tablet, but none of it worked. She just kept insisting that I go look for Aljo. I wanted to, I really did, but I couldn't just leave them with Chase. There was just something off about him and I couldn't trust him. It was almost sundown and Blair was cooking a rabbit over the fire. The sky was a deep pink and the clouds looked blue against it, making it look like a giant sheet of cotton candy. When Blair was done making dinner, I walked to the door of Chase's tent and reluctantly called out, Dinner's ready. No response. I tried again. Still no response. My patience was wearing thin, so I unzipped the door of his tent. I looked inside, surprised at what I found. Rather, surprised at the lack thereof. Chase was gone and there was a huge hole in the back of the tent. I had suddenly lost my appetite. The girls ate dinner and then we all decided to catch up on some sleep and wait for Aljo and Chase to come back. Blair and I went to our tent and Corey to hers. We zipped shut the door and crawled into our sleeping bags. Blair snuggled up next to me as I drifted to sleep. I was awoken by the sound of a screech that sent a shiver down my spine and chilled my blood. I bolted upright and unzipped the tent door, rushing out into the cold night air. The moon was like a resplendent glacier gleaming as rays of sunlight danced through its icy core. I could see clearly in the night, even without the fire, and I rushed over to Corey's tent to see if she was alright. What I found made me almost collapse. Her tent was empty and in the back was a gaping hole exposing the forest on the other side. I found my knife and sheathed it at my hip. I made to leave when Blair stepped in front of me. You aren't going alone. I'm coming with you, she said. Who am I to stop her? I told her to stay close to me and we started off into the forest. My heart was racing inside my chest to get out and escape this damned forest. I dashed through the brush on the forest floor, running for my goddamn life. 
I had lost Blair a few minutes ago, but as much as I willed myself to go back for her, my body wouldn't stop running. I was in fight or flight mode and I had subconsciously chosen flight. I kept running until I came face to face with Aljo. I felt relieved at first until I realized that he wasn't blinking. In fact, he had no eyes. Oh God. His cheeks were torn into a permanent smile, his eyeballs gouged out, and ears ripped off, leaving only bloody holes on the sides of his head. I looked down at his body. His right peck had been cut off, exposing his rib cage underneath, his gut agape, with his innards spilling out like a never-ending rope that a clown would use. I turned to run to my left, but was met with the body of Chase, in a similar state to that of Alja. I stumbled backwards and turned to run the other way but was met with Cory. What was done to her, I won't describe, I already have to see it every night in my dreams. I crumbled to my knees and threw up what little I had in my stomach. That was when I heard a familiar voice. Oh Jackie, you almost got away. I tried to crawl away, but was kicked hard in the ribs. I rolled onto my back, gasping for air and begging for mercy. Blair slammed a knee down on my chest and thrust an arrow through my cheek. I howled in pain as the blood flooded down my throat. My lungs burned for oxygen as I began to drown in my own blood. Blair realized this and gripped the arrow in my cheek, using it to turn me onto my side. She couldn't let me die now, she wanted to make me suffer. She tore the arrow from my face, leaving a bloody hole in my face. She rolled me onto my back again and plunged the arrow into my chest and ripped it down to my gut, exposing my innards. She proceeded to carve out my gut until she could freely peel off the skin and fat, leaving only the muscle exposed. She then stuck the arrow into my eye and began clawing at the exposed muscle of my ABS. Every second was enough pain to make me wish I was dead, but I just needed to grab my knife. She grabbed the arrow again and carved Nolly at he, the Navajo word for property, into my right peck. I felt the cold bone mold handle of my blade and gripped it tight. I brought it up into her eye and dragged it down the side of her face. She recoiled off of me and let out that all too familiar screech and took off into the night. I was found by other campers a few minutes later, unconscious from loss of blood. They had me helicoptered to the nearest hospital. The doctors began surgery right away and miraculously saved my life. You can't trust anyone. I learned that the hard way. Once you trust someone, you become their property. I know because, the scars will never fade, the memories will never fade, my pain will never fade, and I will always be that thing's property. I was claimed by a skinwalker, part 2, by ready user Bloodhunter62. My name is Jake Payne and I was claimed by a skinwalker. I was 22 years old then, and in my final year of college at Clemson University. I had three amazing friends and a beautiful girlfriend who meant the world to me. We decided that on our last days of college, we should do something fun, so we decided to go camping up north. It was the biggest mistake we could have ever made. All of my friends were brutally murdered at the hands of the skinwalker their bodies being horribly mangled and put on display like trophies. My girlfriend was killed, her skin becoming a disgusting flesh suit for the beast. It used her to get close to me and horrifically disfigure me. I was forced to destroy the beautiful face of my girlfriend. She was the love of my life, and I killed her. It's been five months and I still live with the pain of the memories of that week. Not a day goes by that I don't think of ending it all. I toss and turn every night, begging for forgiveness. My dreams are plagued by the memories. Every time I close my eyes, I see Cory, mangled and disfigured beyond recognition. I see Aljo, his entrails hanging from his torn gut, eye sockets bloody and empty, and jaw broken and loosely hanging from the side of his face. I see Chase. As well, bloody holes where his nose, ears, and eyes should be. I hear them plead for mercy, 
screaming in eternal agony. I wish we had never gone on that camping trip. They would still be alive and happy if it weren't for that goddamn trip. It's all my fault. I was the one who suggested it. They didn't even want to go, but I pressured them into it. The only reason I'm still alive is because I'm too much of a coward to pull the damn trigger. I don't even have any money to pay someone to do it for me. I'm just a waste. I get out of bed and go to the kitchen to make some coffee. I make a fresh pot and pour myself a cup. Sitting on the couch and sipping my coffee, I think about the future. It's not something I usually do, especially considering how much I've been wanting to die lately. I'll need a job if I'm going to keep living like this. It's not like anyone will actually hire me though, looking like this. I gently run my fingers along the scar lining my cheek and the hole where my eye once was. I can't even go out in public without children screaming or hiding behind their parents at the sight of me. Others gasp and steer clear of me. Hell, I can clear out a restaurant just by walking in. I'm a monster. Later that day, I decide to try finding a job. I put my resume out there and apply for a few different jobs, such as providing tech support and even working the suicide hotline. I thought that way people wouldn't have to look at me and I can help people. I just feel so useless now and this lets me help people, even if I can't help myself. That night, I decide to take a hot shower before bed. As I enter the shower, I wince as the water hits my body. The heat does not feel very good on my scars. I tough it out and it actually starts to feel quite nice. I get out after a few minutes and head to bed. Laying down, I turn on some relaxing music and start to drift off. I gaze at my surroundings. I'm back in the forest. Oh no, I think to myself, this can't be good. As I take in the setting, I begin to walk around. The ground feels wet on my bare feet and I think I can hear something. It sounds like, screaming. This really doesn't feel right. I begin heading in the direction of the screaming. After five minutes of walking, the screams don't seem to be any closer than before. What the hell? As I think about what I should do next, the screams suddenly get much louder. It sounds like they're coming from all around me, as if a group of howling banshees were surrounding me and getting closer every second. I put my hands over my ears and cower in fear and pain. Just as I think my eardrums are going to burst, it stops. I slowly open my eyes, looking all around me to make sure it's gone. It's then that I see it, the source of the screaming. Standing in front of me is Cory, except she isn't the sweet, innocent girl I once knew. Her mouth is frozen in a chilling scream, blood leaking from her eyes, nose twisted and broken across her once beautiful face. Her neck is torn open, revealing her tongue pulled down through her neck in a fashion resembling a necktie. Her left breast is missing, exposing a bloody mess of exposed muscle and bone beneath. The left side of her torso is ripped open, her entrails hanging out like ropes over the edge of a cliff. Below the waist, her right thigh has an arrow sticking through to the other side, a chunk of muscle stuck on the arrowhead. Her left kneecap is twisted around to the side of her knee, as if it was grabbed and forcibly moved there. The left chin is snapped in half, bone having torn through the flesh and sticking out towards me. I quickly look away and puke up my dinner, along with some blood and bile. I gather my strength and turn to run, but find that she is already there. I turn and run in the other direction, but she's there, as well. No matter where I turn, she's always there. I'm surrounded and can't do anything but look down to avoid the grisly sight. As I collapse to my knees, the screaming begins again. The inescapable screams of pain echo throughout my skull. I jolt awake and run to the bathroom. I splash some cold water on my face and look in the mirror. Who am I? I return to the bedroom turning on the lights and checking the clock. 2.30 am. I turn on the TV and search for something to watch, not daring to go back to sleep. I eventually find something to watch and settle down. The next morning, I get a call back with a job offer. 
I accept and agree to start the following Monday. I wake up on Monday and head down to the call center. I get some nasty looks on the way, but simply ignore them. I'm getting used to the public perception and care less every day. I'm going to help someone today, I think to myself with glee. I can't help but smile at the thought of saving someone's life. This job at the suicide hotline is a blessing, a second chance to do some good. I arrive at the center and am greeted by a beautiful young woman with bronze skin, short black hair, and emerald green eyes. She seemed to be about 5'4 and looked up at me like a normal person. It's like she didn't even notice the scars. It actually makes me quite happy. Hello sir, I presume you're Mr. Payne, she asks in a cheerful tone. Uh, why yeah that's me, I respond, still taken aback by how normally she's treating me. Very well sir, follow me. The woman leads me to a small cubicle in the corner of the room. In it is a small desk with a phone, a nameplate, a coffee machine, and a coffee mug. Here we are sir, the woman says, will that be all? Um, just a second, I start, why are you treating me so normally? Do you not see the scars or something? She takes a moment before answering. I know better than to judge people for their appearance, especially when it comes to scars, she says, lifting her shirt a little to show me a large scar along her ribs. I'm stunned for a second, but soon collect my thoughts and smile. I see. Well, thank you, Miss Kin. My name is Lana Kin. I think it's a very beautiful name. Thank you, Miss Kin. I get on with my day at the center, talking with people who are suicidal for all different reasons. Some are going through a breakup, some are grieving dead family or friends, others are simply sick and tired of living. One by one, I talk them through their problems and help them find other options to help the pain. When my shift ends, I feel satisfied with myself for the first time in a long time. I can finally help people, and that makes me genuinely happy. I'm walking out the door of the center when I heard someone call my name. I turn around to see Lana walking up to me. Hey Jake, you did a great job today, she says cheerfully. I smile, thanks, I'm glad I get this chance to help people every day. Well, it's good to see someone so caring, she beams at me, I'll see you tomorrow, Jake. I get home and take a shower, before getting in bed. I think about Lana. She's really nice to me. It's a welcome change of pace from the hate and disgust I receive from everyone else. I actually feel accepted for the first time since the skinwalker. I smile as I drift off to sleep. I scan my surroundings. I'm in some sort of cave, it seems. I spot a light off in the distance. It flickers like that of a fire, the orange light dancing along the walls of the cave. I try to move but find that my hands are nailed to the wall. As I try to pull them free, the nails grind against my bones and tendons. I grunt in pain, but try to keep silent. I don't know what's out there, but I don't want to find out. I jerk my head forward as I hear what sound like footsteps. Shit. The light dances its way along the walls, closer and closer. The flame of a torch comes into view followed by a figure I know all too well. As Blair approaches me, I feel a mix of anger, sadness, and fear rising up inside me. She smiles an unnaturally wide smile at me and speaks, Did you think you could escape me that easily? Its voice chills me to the bones. Did you actually think you could be happy without me? It's taunting me, playing some sick game with my head. Suddenly, she lunges at me, tearing open my throat. I struggle to breathe, gasping for air and coughing up blood. She just stands there, smiling as I drown in my own blood. I spit at her, but she just keeps smiling. I awaken on my bedroom floor, covered in sweat and gasping for air. I guess I rolled off my bed in my panic to breathe. I try to push myself up off the floor, but I can't. I give up and lie there for the rest of the night. The next day, I walk into the call center and smile to find Lana waiting for me. 
She wears the same bright smile as before. Hey Jake, ready to help people again. I smile and reply, you know it Lana. She smiles and walks me to my desk. See you at the end of the day Jake. Later Lana. It's another long and fulfilling day of helping people. I end my shift and meet Lana at the door. Hey Lana, how are you doing? I ask. Pretty good, but I'm sure the people you talked to today are feeling better, she says with a wink. I laugh and say, you give me way too much credit, Lana. We laugh and say our goodbyes. As I walk into my house, I feel happy. For the first time in a long time, I can actually say I enjoy something. I have a new light in my life. A new thing to look forward to. A new reason to get out of bed each morning. I smile to myself as I head to the bathroom, a hot shower waiting for me. That night, I fall asleep as soon as my head hits the pillow. I open my eyes and find that I'm nose to nose with Blair, her piercing yellow eyes staring back at me. I jerk my head back in fear, only to hit it on the wall behind me. I look down at my wrists, finding them bolted to the wall. I return my attention to Blair, who is still staring at me with a wicked smile etched into her greasy face. Hey Jackie, how ya doin'? She doesn't wait for me to respond before adding, that's great hun, now let's talk about the new bitch in your life. I lunge toward her at the mention of Lana and feel a sharp pain in my wrist. Calm down Jackie, no need to hurt yourself. She seems nice, so I'll leave you two alone from now on. You have my word. I awaken in a pool of sweat and lay there for a few seconds. I think back to Blair's words. Will it actually leave? I reach up to wipe the sweat from my face. I look at my wrist finding broken and limp. I try to move it again and pain shoots up through my arm like an Iron Maiden is being clamped on it. I get dressed and head to the local hospital. They take some unnecessary x-rays and put it in a cast. This sucks. A lot. I head to the center the following day. As I walk in, Lana goes to greet me. Hey Jake Dash she stops when she sees the cast. Oh my god, what happened? She asks. I got it caught, behind the microwave. Yeah, that's what happened. I give a pathetic smile. I've never been a good liar, but I can't let her know what really happened. UMM, how exactly did you do that? She asks, visibly holding back laughter. Hey, how about we talk about it over dinner later? I ask, trying to salvage the situation. I'd like that she responds, smiling. The rest of the day goes by as usual. At the end of the day, I meet up with Lana at the entrance. So, where are we going? She asks. How about we get some sushi? I suggest. Lead the way, Jake. We get to the restaurant and sit at the bar. A few drinks in, she asks me what really happened to my hand. I tell her about my night terrors and that I rolled out of bed and landed on it. It's kind of true, I think to myself. She buys it and we finally get our food. We have a great time at dinner and she says she'd like to do this again sometime. I smile at her and respond with a slurred, definitely. I get home and go straight to bed. As I fall asleep, I picture Lana smiling at me. Nothing can take this away from me. That night, I didn't have a single nightmare. I woke up with a smile on my face and thought to myself, this is the start of something great. The next few weeks are amazing. I end up going out with Lana every night and never have any nightmares again. I look forward to each and every day with Lana. I wake up with energy and make breakfast, before heading to the call center. I walk in and hug Lana. We talk for a few minutes before hugging once again and going our separate ways. The rest of the day is normal, and we meet up at the end. Lana and I go out for drinks and have a great time. We take one or two more shots than we probably should. Hey Jake, she says through slurred words, I don't think I should be driving tonight. Do you live nearby? 
I smile and take her hand, leading her toward my house. She blushes and follows along. We get to my house and head straight to the bedroom. We have a great time and fall asleep in each other's arms. I open my eyes and find Blair staring at me, smiling that twisted smile. Oh Jackie, you seem so happy, she says in a sarcastic tone. I know I said I would leave you alone, but I just had to see you one last time. Just to wish you luck. I lunge at her, finding that my hands are no longer bound. I wrap my hands around her neck and squeeze with all my strength. I feel her windpipe cave in, her vertebrae snapping and popping under my fingers. She pleads for me to stop, but I can't. I see the light fading from her emerald green eyes and feel at peace. She stops moving and I smile. I open my eyes. What is this? I stare down at my hands locked around Lana's throat. Her beautiful eyes, once full of life, stare blankly back at me. I slowly release her neck and look at my hands. I can't think. This isn't real. I stand up and start pacing, running my hands through my hair. This can't be real. I start slapping myself. Wake up. Please just wake up. I fall to my knees and start crying. Please, just wake up. I turn and look under the bed. I reach under and take out my last hope. At least I can end the pain. A few minutes later, everything's ready. As I slip the noose over my head, I look over at Lana. I love you. Diary of a Downward Spiral By Reddit user Joe.93 Personal Diary of Felicity Beaumont March 21st. Dear Diary, oh god, I haven't done something like this since I was a little girl. It just sounds so silly coming from me now. It's amazing how life can change in the blink of an eye. A couple of months back I was in peak physical condition, training to run a marathon. Now I'd be lucky to hobble to the bathroom. How did this all happen? That's a good question. I can hardly remember myself. The last thing I remember is visiting a friend's house for a Christmas party, and then waking up in the ICU barely being able to move. To my understanding, black ice was the culprit. I guess it was the airbag that saved my life, or what was left of it. So, here I am now. The doctors recommended that I start writing things down. They say it will help me better keep my emotions in check and maybe even jog my memory. Jog my memory? Maybe I should choose my words a little more carefully. Everyone always tells me how lucky I am to be alive, but you know what? That's bullshit. I'm supposed to tell the truth here, if only here. Anyone who thinks we're lucky just for existing is too stupid to understand that there are in fact worse things than dying. I haven't slept well for fucking months now. The funny thing about tossing and turning is that you don't start to appreciate it until you can't do it anymore and I keep hearing voices coming from upstairs. When I finally do get to sleep I am haunted by hellish nightmares of the accident. It's the same horrifying images played on loop each time, my body being meshed and compressed along with the cold hard steel from the car, my body, and it forming some kind of demented sandwich. Every morning, I wake up and spend a good minute or so trying to force myself out of bed, eager to pour myself a cup of coffee and take on the day. The sight of my bed sores and the agonizing pain that comes with them snap me back to reality really quick. Okay, okay, enough negativity for today. I have to remember what the psychologist said. Try your best to focus on the positive. I hate to break it to you, Doc, but once you've been ton off the road going 70 miles an hour, the rose-tinted spectacles you've been wearing your entire life tend to turn to shit. Here I am now laying in a hospital bed set up in my family room. I can't even go upstairs in my own bed. And with the string of burglaries that's been going on lately, anyone could get in here in the middle of the night and I'd be completely helpless. My husband Jack said he'll take care of it though and make sure nothing happens to me. At the very least, 
I guess I do in fact have him to be thankful for. I'll tell you what, if it wasn't for him, I don't know what I would have done. The poor thing was in the passenger seat that night. He had too much to drink that night and was riding shotgun. I've seen pictures of what's left of the car and believe me when I tell you that that side took the brunt on it. The luck on my hubby though, other than some bumps and bruises he'll be back to his old self in no time. Even though he wasn't driving, I think he still feels a little guilty for what happened. He has to work a lot, but he made sure to get me the most expensive caretaker he could find to watch over me when he cannot be there. She seems great, I'll give her that, but for the money I would think she would have a slightly better attendance record. What was her name again? Alexa something or other. My mind is drawing a blank right now. Although, the doctors won't admit it. I think this medicine is fucking with my head. It always has. But what can I do? I gotta take it. Asthma in a bedridden patient is a big no-no. The last thing I need is to catch pneumonia. Thank goodness for Jack and Alexa. They make sure that I never miss a dose. Well, I think that's enough for now. I'm kinda tired. Hopefully I won't need this hospital bed much longer. I miss going upstairs and sleeping next to Jack. It's too bad this damn hospital bed was only built for one. March 28th. Dear Diary. No, you know what? Dear God, I wish I was dead. Why couldn't he just kill me and be done with it? There's a lot of things I can put up with, but there is a limit to this nightmarish hell that I am willing to endure. Did I ever tell you that I can't even wipe my own ass anymore? Nurse or no nurse, I don't care if you have a whole squad of caretakers on standby, words cannot even begin to describe how much that hurts your pride. But wait, there's more. I had myself a little accident today. Alexa sat me up on the toilet today to do my business. Everything was going okay until the telephone started to ring. I don't know what possessed her to do this but she left me in there alone while she ran to go get it. I wound up falling at a weird angle and banging my face against the sink. Now I look like I went 15 rounds with Mike Tyson. The three of us had a talk about it when Jack got home from work. It turns out she was under orders from him to make sure the phone got answered. I guess he was expecting an important phone call. I'm glad to know Jack's job takes precedent over me. It's nice to know where I stand. Where I stand? Look at me there a go again. I talked to him about it after she left. He apologized profusely and promised that from now on, Alexa is to under no circumstances talk on the phone while I am in her care. That was all I got, and I'm sorry, and an assurance that it wouldn't happen again. My head was killing me and he didn't even offer to massage my neck or anything. He told me he would have his Amazon Echo to remind him to pick up some cream for my eye. I don't think Jack realizes that I can still remember where he keeps his gun. He's lucky I cannot get up out of this bed for myself. This room could use some redecorating and I think my brains would be the perfect shade of red. I'm no gun expert, but I did in fact take a photography class in high school. The general idea is basically the same, you just point and shoot. April 20th. Dear Dia you know what? Forget it. That's too childish. Down to business. I'm sorry it has been so long since I've last written. I promised the doctor I'd try to maintain a more consistent schedule. It has all been for good reason though I assure you. I'm sorry about my last post. I was in a very dark place, but I've had some good long sessions with my psychologist and after a swift medication change. I think I will be okay. Plus, where my future once seemed bleak and uncertain, I now have a glimmer of hope. I've been working extra hard, both at physical therapy and back at home here with Alexa. I'm proud to report that some of my movement has started to come back. I am now able to hoist myself up in bed and sit up for a little bit. The doctors were very pleased with me. They say if I keep this up I might even be able to walk again. Granted, it would most likely be with a cane and I wouldn't be running a marathon anything soon, but it would be so nice to be able to walk upstairs again, 
to get to sleep in my own bed again. Unfortunately, that's where the good news stops. I wish Jack would have been more excited. He barely said two words on the ride home. He was too preoccupied with his damn phone. It must have taken us 20 extra minutes to get home. We hit every goddamn red light on the way. If he wasn't checking a text, he was yelling into that stupid thing, Siri, do this. Siri, remind me about that. Talk to me, you son of a bitch. I might have banged my head a little in the accident, but I'm not an idiot. I am your wife. Let me help you. Take your eyes off the phone and talk to me. At least tell me who you're texting. That'd be something to talk about. But no, he's been so secretive lately, and I can't stand it. Ever since the accident he's been this way, he says he loves me, but his heart just isn't in it. At first I was grateful he got Alexa to help me out, but now I'm starting to think it was just more convenient for him to pay someone rather than deal with me himself. I don't know. I guess I'm done for now. I'm exhausted. Those damn voices won't let up. April 27. I haven't been sleeping well lately. Remember about the voices I was hearing? I feel like they're getting louder. I didn't get to sleep until around 5 a.m. this time. Jack keeps saying he doesn't hear anything. I don't know he can't. I swear they must be coming right from our room. He keeps telling me that I'm just dreaming it, but I can tell the difference between dreams and reality. I am only having one dream and it's still the nightmare of the accident. These voices are all too real. One of these days, I'll be strong enough to get out of this bed, and I'm gonna confront them. I know that I am not crazy. Alexa didn't show up today. According to Jack, she wasn't feeling well. So, it was just the two of us today. I must admit, today he did seem to be a bit more attentive than normal. We actually had a halfway pleasant day. Even though I was pretty tired, he actually managed to take my mind off it. He picked just like he did when he carried me though the door when we first bought the house, and he placed me into the passenger seat of his convertible. We had a pleasant drive in the country and for dinner he took me where we had our first date. He apologized for being so tied up with work lately and presented me with a bottle perfume, both as a gift for doing so well with my therapy, and an apology. The bottle was partially empty but I didn't care. This stuff isn't easy to find anymore. He said he got it at a garage sale. He knows how much I love the old-fashioned stuff. At least he was thinking of me. I was so excited I could hardly contain myself. I think that's enough for now. It's nice not being able to sleep from excitement. I never thought I would feel this way again. God damn it. Son of a bitch. I can't believe it. Does he think I'm some kind of an idiot or something? I refuse to put up with this. Alexa came back to work today. She smelled awfully familiar. I cannot believe that I didn't notice this before. That bitch was wearing perfume. The same kind that Jack claimed he found for me. I'll be he looked really hard alright. I can't believe I didn't see it before. Alexa's absences, Jack's clandestine phone calls, him being constantly preoccupied. And those voices, I wasn't imagining them at all, and that bastard tried had me thinking maybe I really was was imagining it. I am not going to stand for this, literally. If I wasn't determined to walk again before, I am for sure now. I'm not gonna let him make a fool out of me. He will pay for this. May 26th. I think this will be my last entry for a while. I'm sorry I've been gone for so long again. I had to take some time to myself. It's all been worth it though. Unfortunately for my husband, my dreams have been coming in nice and clear lately. I remember everything now. That night of the accident, my husband was in the passenger seat after he put himself there. One of us drank too much that night, and it was him. I was never the designated driver. I've been training harder than I ever thought possible, both at therapy and here at home. 
I decided to put my sleepless nights to good use and get in some extra exercise. No one knows this. Not Alexa. Not my husband. Nobody. I can walk again. I've had to hide it from everyone. I'm not in tip-top shape yet and my balance is very shaky and I'm not the fastest, but I think I can do the stairs. I can hear then two of them talking up there right now. I think I'll drop in and pay them a little visit. Oh boy are they gonna be surprised. I found where Jack moved his gun. I guess he isn't as good at hiding things as he is. It's time to end this. I hope he burns in hell for what he did to me. To whoever reads this first, my doctor, the authorities, I'm sorry, but this was the only way. The following day. This is a Channel 7 News special bulletin. We begin tonight with the tragic story of a domestic abuse situation turned deadly. 32-year-old Felicity Beaumont was found dead late yesterday afternoon after her caretaker arrived late for a shift to find her laying motionless at the bottom of the stairs, clutching a 9mm pistol in her hand. Her husband, 34-year-old Jack Beaumont, was found clinging to life in the couple's bedroom after suffering a severe gunshot wound to the chest. When he was discovered, he could still be heard muttering into his Amazon Echo saying, Alexa, dial 911. Authorities believe Ms. Beaumont to have been brandishing the firearm when she slipped down the stairs, causing her to break her neck. 